Welcome to week 12 of Pharmacology for Vocational Nursing 1. Wow, can you believe it's week 12 already? This week we're going to discuss CNS depressants and the muscle relaxers. So let's get started. So one type of the CNS depressants are the sedatives. These are drugs that have an inhibitory effect on the central nervous system to the degree that they reduce nervousness, excitability, and irritability. They really do not cause sleep and they're not intended to cause sleep, but they can become hypnotics if they're given in large enough doses. Then we have our hypnotics. These do cause sleep. So that's their job, right? They are a much more potent, they have a much more potent effect on the central nervous system than sedatives. And a sedative can actually become a hypnotic if it's given in a large enough dose. Also, you have to remember the response to these medications, whether it's sedative or hypnotic, can be based on the patient's individual response and their tolerance to the medications. Because we have many drugs that can be both sedative and hypnotic, we have the hyphenated term sedative hypnotic. So these are medications that are dose dependent. At low doses, they calm the central nervous system without inducing sleep. And at higher doses, they calm the central nervous system to the point of causing sleep. These sedative hypnotics are classified into three main groups, the barbiturates, the benzodiazepines, and then we have some miscellaneous drugs. So with all this talk about sedative and hypnotic, let's talk about sleep for a minute. Normal sleep is cyclic and it's repetitive. A sleeping person is unaware of sensory stimuli within the immediate environment. And that brings us to sleep architecture. What is that? Well, it's the patterns of sleep. As we said, the patterns are cyclic and they repeat throughout the sleep cycle. So there are two patterns. There's REM sleep, or rapid eye movement and not REM sleep. During periods of rapid eye movement, the brain is almost as active as when you're awake. You actually have four stages of sleep. In stage one to three, there's no rapid eye movement. So those are non REM sleep. Stage one is the time where you move from that wakefulness stage to sleep. Stage two, is a stage of light sleep. You actually spend most of your time in stage two as you repeat the cycles. In stage three, that's the time when you're in deep sleep. This is when you get what you need to feel refreshed when you wake up. Your breathing, your heart rate are at their slowest and their lowest during stage three. REM sleep, that's stage four occurs about 90 minutes after you fall asleep. It's called REM because the eyes move from side to side behind your closed eyelids. And your brain activity during this time increases close to that of wakefulness. Your breathing, your pulse, and your blood pressure all return to near waking levels. The majority of your dreams occur during the REM phase, but not all of them. Now, REM interference is when there is a drug-induced reduction in the REM sleep. That's usually caused by a prolonged use of a sedative hypnotic. REM rebound can occur when a patient discontinues the use of a sedative hypnotic. So what happens there is that the patient then usually has an unusually large amount of REM sleep. They may experience especially realistic or more vivid dreams as a result. So that's just a little brief overview of sleep. Let's talk about the drugs. The CNS depressants, the benzodiazepines. These were formerly the most commonly prescribed sedative hypnotics. Non-benzodiazepines now are currently being more frequently prescribed. We have new uh, hypnotic drugs and new sedative drugs that have um, uh, less potential for abuse, which is why the benzodiazepines have fallen out of favor, to, so to speak. The benzodiazepines in and of themselves actually have a pretty favorable drug effect profile. They're very if, if, uh, effective, their eff efficacy is, is documented, and they're safe, relatively safe, when taken as directed. So benzodiazepines are classified as either sedative, hypnotic, 
or anxiolytic. Anxiolytic is being medications that relieve anxiety. And the way they're classified depends on the use and the dose. Remember, they could be sedative or hypnotic based on the dose. And the same applies with the anxiolytic effect. Much of the classification, then, is just based on use and dose. In Table 12.2 of your book, there's a list of sedative hypnotics that you might find helpful as you study. So the benzodiazepine sedative hypnotic types, um, these are categorized as long-acting, intermediate-acting, or short-acting. And that's basically depending on their onset and their duration of action. So our long-acting are the diazepam or Valium and clonazepam. Clonazepam being the longest of those. That's also called clonopin. Our intermediate acting is alprazolam or Xanax, lorazepam, that's Ativan, and temazepam, that's Restoril. Temazepam is reserved typically for use as a sleep uh, a hypnotic. Um, short acting is our midazolam, that's Versed, and triazolam, Halcyon. Those short acting you're going to see used only in the clinical setting. Those are not uh, going to be used in a prescription that the patient's going to take home. So regardless of whether they're short acting, intermediate acting, or long acting, how do they work? Well, they depress the central nervous system activity. They do this by affecting the hypothalamic, thalamic, and the limbic system of the brain. The benzodiazepine receptors are really GABA. So let's talk for a minute about GABA. The sedative hypnotics show considerable chemical diversity, but they share in their ability to modulate the chloride influx via the interaction with the GABA receptor chloride channel complex. So what this means is that there's very, there's these little subunits in the receptors. The GABA enhances the chloride influx by binding to either an alpha or a beta subunit. Then the chloride influx hyperpolarizes the neuron and that hyperpolarization makes it less likely to fire in response to the stimulation. So that's how they work. They decrease this ability to stimulate. As a result, they also do not suppress rapid eye movement sleep as much as the barbiturates do, and they don't increase the metabolism of other drugs as much as some of the barbiturates do, or the other CNS depressants. Now our benzodiazepines have this calming effect, that's what we want it to do, right? A calming effect on the central nervous system. They're very useful in controlling agitation and anxiety. They do reduce excessive stimu uh, sensory stimulation, thus inducing sleep, and they can also induce skeletal muscle relaxation. Because of these effects, they're also risky when used with opioids. And you may be hearing a lot in the media about opioid crisis. Many of our opioid overdoses have been found to be a result of when benzodiazepines are used in, when, in conjunction with opioids. So what are our indications for benzodiazepines? Well, when we need sedation to induce sleep as a skeletal muscle relaxant, when we have anxiety and we need relief from anxiety or anxiety-related depression. These are not, however, antidepressant drugs. So anxiety-related depression, you really have to be careful if your patient is taking those for that reason. We need to maybe do a SBAR and make a recommendation or make a referral to see what we could do to help get them on a different medication. And so sometimes you will see this with an anxiety-related and related depression as a short-term intervention because the benzodiazepines really have a relatively short half-life and when used as directed, are relatively safe. Other indications include treatment of acute seizure disorder. We will use these definitely in the treatment of alcohol withdrawal when we have 
delirium tremens. We'll talk about that in the next semester. The relief of agitation. We will use these in balanced anesthesia. We talked about balanced anesthesia and moderate and conscious sedation last week. So our benzodiazepines are sometimes used there as an adjunct. Our benzodiazepine adverse effects are pretty mild and infrequent, but they can occur. Headache, drowsiness, dizziness, cognitive impairments, pretty high up on the list. Vertigo, lethargy, obviously this is what we're giving it for, right, is a sedative effect. And because of that, they make falls in the elderly more uh, likely to occur. Sometimes the patient will also have a hangover effect or daytime sleepiness from the use of a benzodiazepine. If we have abrupt discontinuation after a period of use, the patient may also have some rebound insomnia. Toxicity and overdose can occur. When we have toxicity or overdose, the patient will have somnolence, which is excessive sleeping. Confusion, they may go into a coma. They may have diminished reflexes. They don't cause hypotension and respiratory depression unless they're taken with other CNS depressants or in excessive dose, as in such an overdose. When we have overdose of the benzodiazepines, treatment is symptomatic and supportive care. Sometimes they'll need respiratory help. Uh, flumazenil can be given intravenously in the presence of a benzodiazepine overdose, but it's not used very often. And it's not used very often because it can cause seizures. There are sometimes patients who will request flumazepil, uh, flumazenil excuse me, for their uh, benzodiazepine addiction because they've been led to believe that it'll clear the benzodiazepine from their system and they'll no longer be addicted. However, this is a gross misrepresentation of this drug. I have seen this drug used in acute rehabilitation settings uh, for overdose and it is given only IV and only in the patient who has a known benzodiazepine overdose. Usually it's only given in very grave situations. So what are some of the interactions that occur with benzodiazepines? Well, the azole antifungals like our ketoconazole, our fluconazole, these are strong CYP3A4 or CYP2C9 inhibitors. And so these medications can cause a decrease in the metabolism of the benzodiazepine as do things like verapamil, ditalizem, our protease inhibitors, macrolide antibiotics, and grapefruit juice. Our CNS depressants like alcohol and opioids, they will have an additive effect. So these will cause a potentiation. Olanzapine is going to increase the effects as well whereas rifampin is going to decrease the effect of the benzodiazepine because it will increase the metabolism. Our CNS depressants that are non-benzodiazepine hypnotics share many of the characteristics of the benzodiazepines. They're used to treat insomnia. Examples of these are Zaliflon, uh, Zaliflon, excuse me, Sonata, Zolpidem, that's our Ambien, uh, Lunesta, I always have a problem with that one. It's ezoplycone. <laughs> uh, and then Rosarem or Remelteon. Um, our, our ezoplycone or Lunesta and extended release Zolpidem, that's Ambien CR, are approved for long term therapy. The others are not. And Ambien is starting to fall out of favor because of its ability to cause people to do things while they think they're asleep, but they're away. They're walking and driving and doing things um, that they wouldn't necessarily do. Now, one of these favorable ones is the Ramaltion, the Rosarim, um, because it doesn't cause CNS depression and it has no potential for abuse or no withdrawal signs or symptoms. That's because it's a melatonin receptor agonist, which means that it's believed to act by promoting the receptors to uptake the endogenous melatonin. So it could be used for long term and it's not on the beers list. So now we're going to have to go to a part two. 
So I'll see you in a few minutes.